Um, this, this presentation actually has its genesis in my, the first five chapters of the first volume of my three-volume book called Jesus is Not the Answer to Every Sunday School Question. No, I did not bring any to send, to, to sell rather, uh, but they are available on Amazon if you, if you so desire. But frankly, I'd say save your money, watch my videos online, they're better and they're free. <laughs> Never going to get rich with that kind of sales pitch, am I? <laughs> So why should we, anyone believe the Bible? Uh, like I said, it comes from the first five chapters of my, of my first, first book, wherein I used to stand before my Sunday school class. Uh, God called me to teach at around 2003-ish, and I taught uh, Sunday school, uh, sixth grade Sunday school at Antioch Bible Church, just down the road here at Peace Yonder, for about 17 years. And then... Um, and then later on, God had me expand my, he expanded my audience to include uh, older kids and then even adults, um, as you are witness of tonight. And every, every, son, every, every new school year, I would stand before my class, and I would hold up the Bible, and I said, who here believes the Bible? And of course, you know, we're in Sunday school class, so, you know, the overwhelming majority of the kids raised their hand because they do believe the Bible, and those that raised, there probably were some in the class that, did, that raised their hands that didn't believe the Bible, but they did it because all the other kids were raising their hands anyway. So my standard line was, if we're going to be locked in this Sunday school classroom together for the next nine months, we better make sure this book is worth reading, right? Why should, do we, should we, is, is it worthy of our belief? And so then I would go on this, 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 you know, this, this multi-week series on you know, why anyone should believe the Bible. Well, if you might notice here, this presentation has a little 2.0 underneath the title, if, but it's not seen here. There we go. A little 2.0 underneath the uh, title. And you know what that means, don't you? That means it's new and improved. <laughs> so why is it new and improved, Dan? Well, I'll, tell you, I'll talk a little bit more about this as the presentation goes on, but in short, it's more biblical, it's shorter, and it's easier to remember. So back about, in a, how did, so how did version 2.0 come about? Well, back in about August of 2020, uh, about two and a half months before I was supposed to deliver this presentation in its original form, God turned my world completely upside down again, <laughs> as he has the habit of doing, and convinced me that I needed to, to trash it and start all over again. Throw out the old presentation, start off with something completely brand new. Um, that, was, that was really hard, but I've, I've managed to reduce the entire presentation, why should anyone believe the Bible, down to one slide. If you're note takers, you might want to get your pen, and pen, your pen and pad ready and take notes, because this next slide is crucial. It's the most important slide of the entire deck. And if you miss this, the whole rest of the present, the, whole, the, the next hour, is going to be just meaningless. OK, you ready? ready? So why should anyone believe the Bible? The answer is very simple, because it's true. Amen. Can you think of a better reason to believe anything, right? OK, we're done. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, of course. i got to earn my keep up here. So the real question is, how do we know the Bible is true? Right? We believe the Bible because it's true, but how do we know that it's true? Because let's face it, the Bible that, you, that we, you and I say that we believe has got a lot of stuff in it that the world thinks is pretty ridiculous, if you stop and think about it, right? So for, for example, we get three chapters into the book, and what do we see? We see a naked woman in a garden having a conversation with a talking snake. I mean, not just talking to the talking snake, but having a conversation with it and reasoning with a serpent. And if that didn't tickle your funny bone, by the time you get over to Numbers 22, you get to witness a prophet arguing, arguing with a donkey. I'm a big fan of the movie Shrek. That's why I always have to say donkey whenever I encounter the word donkey in the Bible. So yeah, there's a talking donkey. And things get super crazy way later on when we see singing and dancing produce. The kids are looking at me like, for real? You remember seeing singing and dancing produce in the Bible? <laughs> the young one over there is just like, is this guy for real, Dad? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is one of those things that I do to keep, uh, to keep, the, kids, to keep the kids entertained and to keep the parents on their toes. Uh, when we get over to um, Genesis 19, 
we see Lot's salty wife. Remember this story, right? The heartwarming tale of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God you know, comes down and he says, Lot, I'm going to destroy the, the, the entire city. Get you and your wife and your kids and, and their wives and get out. And what he says, don't look back. And so they're boogieing on out of town. Starts raining sulfur. And what's Lot's wife do? I forgot the silverware. She looks back and she gets turned into a pillar of salt. So yeah, we got Lot's salty wife in Genesis chapter 19. Or how about in 2 Kings chapter 6? We see the, 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 a floating axe head. You remember this? Right? The, the prophets are out there. They're like, they need a new seminary because the old one was too, was too small. So they need a new seminary. Some of the prophets are out there. Uh, you know, one with a borrowed axe head. He's whacking away at a tree. Axe head goes flying off. <laughs> Bloop. Falls in the Jordan River. And he starts freaking out. <laughs> like, why are you freaking out? Hey, because it's a borrowed axe head. Because you know, seminary students don't have enough money to buy their own axe heads, right? So he borrowed one. And this is, this is rather distressing. So what do we see? We see my man Elisha roll up on the scene like Fix It Felix, and he says, I know what I'll do. I'll take a stick, and I'll throw it in the Jordan River, and that'll change the specific gravity of the water just enough so that the axe head floats. So he did. He threw the, axe, he threw the stick on the water, axe head floats, Seminary student reaches down, puts it back on his axe head, and presumably goes about chopping again. It's crazy, right? The stuff, is, the stuff is weird. And of course, I could go on and on about things like rivers and seas parting, water coming from rocks after speaking to it and then after striking it, water turning to blood, city walls coming down by blowing on some horns. How about men rising from the dead? To say nothing about if anyone among you wants to be great, he must first become the slave of all. Or how about love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? This is weird stuff, folks. How about turn the other cheek? Or how about this? God became man and died on a cross to pay the penalty for your sins, and that by the simple act of confessing that Jesus is God in the flesh and believing that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved from, your, from an eternity in hell, which is the right and just punishment for sins that you've committed against a holy and eternal God. This is a message that the world just finds absolutely incredible. And yet we're like, yeah, we believe the Bible. Huh. But you know, you really shouldn't be worried about this. I don't see many of you worried, but you're kind of wondering where, where is this guy going with all this? But we shouldn't be worried about this because God warned us, right? He, he warned us about this. He says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot, it's not that he will not, he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So we shouldn't find it at all surprising that the world looks at us and says, hey, just a bunch of Bible thumpers, you guys checked your brains at the church door and you forgot to pick them up on the way out. Well, of course they're going to believe that. They can't understand. So, but have you ever heard anybody argue for the truth of Scripture from supernatural events like this? Yeah, I believe the Bible because of, you know, salty women and talking snakes and talking donkeys and all that. That's the reason why I believe the Bible. That's why you should believe the Bible too. You ever hear anybody argue that way? I mean, not even on Twitter, right? You, you just don't see this kind of argumentation. I, I, don't, I don't think I have. So it's been my experience that when most Christians are asked... How do you know that the Bible is true? Their answers typically sound something like, because of the evidence. Oop, back up. Because of the evidence. Well, I've got a red asterisk there next to the word evidence, and that's to remind me to define my terms. What is evidence? Or, to quote a favorite movie of mine, Hefe, what is evidence? Well, evidence in, in the context in which, of this presentation is, is simply this. Things like manuscripts, archaeological finds, the odds of fulfilled prophecies, the philosophical arguments, miracles, and science. In short, when I say evidence in the context of this presentation, what I'm talking about is any extra-biblical information used to persuade or to prove to the non-believer that the Bible is true. Did you catch that? 
A heavy emphasis on extra biblical evidence because when we get over to Acts, I think it's chapter 6 or maybe early on in Acts chapter 7, Scripture is called evidence, right? So when I'm talking about evidence here, I'm talking specifically about extra biblical information that we use to try to prove pe to people that the Bible is true. For example, we could talk about, you know, in the Old Testament, there are about 14,000 manuscripts and manuscript fragments. We could talk about the New Testament, there are about 6,000 manuscripts and fragments, averaging about 450 pages each. We could talk about archaeological finds. We could talk about the odds of one man fulfilling some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament and the statistical probabilities of those prophecies being fulfilled. Matter of fact, the first five chapters of my book and the first version of this presentation was nothing but that. Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, uses the acronym MAPS, Manuscript Evidence, Archaeology, Prophecy, and Statistical Probability. Version 1.0 of this presentation was one hour of MAPS, Manuscript Evidence, Archaeology, Prophecy, Statistical Probability. But you know what? And I, and I had delivered that presentation dozens of times. And I had a guy in, in Idaho, in Boise, Idaho, tell me, he says, you know, after that presentation, he says, you know, Dan, I have learned more about the Bible and apologetics in 50 minutes of your presentation than I did in, in years of Sunday school. I was like, ooh, that's, that's quite an indictment of your Sunday school, don't you think? So I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Because the even bigger problem with that, that I, that I had with that, was that every time I delivered this presentation, version 1.0, I felt utterly defeated at the end. Everybody else seemed to love it. Like, oh, this is so encouraging. It's so, it's so great. There's lots of great information in there. But I always felt so defeated at the end, like, what have I proven? What have I done? I've done nothing. And I couldn't shake this feeling, and I couldn't figure it out, because, first of all, I'm a man, Secondly, I'm a former athlete, took too many hits to the head and too many charges on the basketball court, and I'm blonde. I got a lot going against me here, folks. It's, uh, I, I'm a little slow sometimes. So dozens and dozens of times of preparing, this pre in preparing to delivering this presentation, I couldn't figure out what in the world was wrong with it. Hmm. The Holy Spirit just kept hounding me, and he kept saying, you know, you haven't really proven anything. And there were several, but there were several problems. And uh, I, I talked to another brother in the Lord who had, at the time, uh, a very, very different approach to apologetics than I had. Very, very different, one that I had never seen before. And he also comes from a different theological camp within Orthodox Christianity, not capital O Orthodox, but, you know, he's not like a, a crazy believer. Uh, but he's, you know, a straight-up brother in the Lord, but he comes from a different theological camp than I do. And he had some really interesting ideas that really challenged the way I thought about apologetics. And so I asked him, I told him about my dilemma with this presentation. I said, would you be willing to watch this presentation and tell me what you think? And he said, yeah, sure. So the next day, caught up with him again. I said, did you watch it? And he says, yes, I did. I said, well, what'd you think of it? He goes, I hated it. I'm like, Yes! Yes! Finally, I found somebody who hates my presentation. Please, tell me why. He says, I'm not going to tell you why. I'm like, oh, come on. He says, I'm going to ask you one question. I said, okay, go ahead. Is that the reason why you believe the Bible? Uh, <laughs> uh no. <laughs> he says, well, why do you believe the Bible? And then just right off the top, it took me like three and a half seconds, and I just rattled off an answer, which is the, the rest of this presentation. And he says, well, you know what the problem is, right? He's like, why are you spending an hour standing in front of people telling them that you should believe the Bible because of manuscript evidence, archaeology, prophecy, and statistical probability when that's not what you believe? Ooh. You know what they call that, right? When you say one thing, but you do another? What do you call that? It's okay, I've heard it before. It's hypocrisy, right? That, that feeling that I was feeling when I got done delivering the presentation was hypocrisy. It's the Holy Spirit saying, hypocrite. <laughs> Man. So here I am, two and a half months before I'm supposed to deliver this presentation for another ministry at another church locally. And now I'm a little bit stressed because I can't deliver the presentation in its current form back then. So I had to start all over again. 
selected the second slide and the second to last slide and everything in between, threw it in the trash, saved the file, and started from scratch. The result is what you're going to see here today. So what did I discover? Well, I discovered, after <laughs> getting back into the scriptures, is that it's not about evidence. It's not about extra-biblical evidence. So you remember in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells us about the account of the rich man and Lazarus, right? And how the rich man, being in torment in Hades, begged for Abraham to just dip his finger in, a, in, in some water and tip it, touch it to the tip of his tongue because he was in agony in the flames. And do you remember what Father Abraham's response was to the, to the rich man? Abraham said to the rich man in Hades, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Do, do you see what Abraham was appealing to? What was he appealing to? Pro tip, if I ask you a question, chances are the answers are in bold. Just in case. So what is it that Abraham appealed to? Moses and the prophets, we would call that the, the Old Testament, or they would just call it the scriptures, right? The law. He says, look, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. If they do not believe them, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Huh. So he appealed to scripture as being the ultimate authority, not our experiences and not supernatural occurrences or miracles. Hey, how many of you know the Great Commission? Does anybody have the Great Commission memorized? These are, these are Jesus' you know, last words to us before he ascended into heaven. These are our marching orders. Does anybody have those memorized? I saw your hand move. You just bought it. I, I saw your hand move. That means you just bought the boat. <laughs> Can you recite for us the, the Great Commission? Even if it's just a paraphrase. We're not going to grade you on it. Yeah, so Jesus starts off by saying, all authority on heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations, teach, baptizing, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Okay, so as evangelical Christians, most of us have a pretty good familiarity with the, the Great Commission. If not its precise wording, then at least we know the gist of it. We're supposed to go out and make disciples. But do you know? So that's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now, without consulting your cell phones, can you tell me what verse 17 says? The verse right before it. Any takers? No takers? It says, talks about the 11 being there, right? Because Judas done hung himself, so there were only 11 other guys there. And what does it say? It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that these guys after spending three years watching Jesus preach and teach and heal and smack the Pharisees around, rhetorically speaking, of course, after all this, some of them still were doubtful? Did anybody see more evidence of Jesus' deity than the 11? I, I really doubt it, right? Because they were there for all of it. From, the, from day one to the, day, to, the, to the last day. So, I mean, John 21, 25 tells us this, right? There are so many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that not even the world itself would be able to contain the books that would be written. So what we have is the very teensiest tip of the iceberg of what Jesus said and did. And this is supposed to be enough for us to believe the disciples had way more than that, and yet some of them were doubtful. So what does that tell you? Is our faith a matter of seeing miracles or hearing good sermons? No. What's, what is going on here? 
Well, I think we, if we go back in the gospel accounts, we go back to an earlier account in the gospel of Mark, I think we can start to see what's going on here, why, why, why we're, we're seeing this really strange picture develop before us. We go back to the gospel of Mark in chapter 6. Jesus goes back to his, uh, his home synagogue in Nazareth. Remember, he grew up in Nazareth. And he began to teach in the synagogue, and many of those who heard him were absolutely flabbergasted. They're like, whoa! And they started saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? It's not just the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon. Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Now, wait a minute. Did anybody deny, was anybody denying his wisdom? No, they were marveling at it. Was anybody denying the fact that he was doing miracles? No, they were marveling at that too. But why would they take offense at him? You ever stop to think about that? Like, why would they be offended by this guy? They're looking at him and they're like, how does this guy think he is? See, every time I try to do the, the voice of a Jewish guy, it sounds like Paul Grape from VeggieTales. So my apologies for that. It's the best I can do. Who is, who is this guy? That's, I remember this. This is, this is little Yeshua. He used to run around the synagogue, you know? And now he's up here teaching? What? So what's going on here? Why would they take offense at him? I think it's because they're, you should take note of their worldview. Right? They knew Jesus' family. They probably knew, up, knew him as he was growing up. And their preconceived ideas of who Jesus was is pre- was preventing them from accepting for who he truly is, God in the flesh. So they came to Jesus, the adult Jesus, and watched him teach, and they still had Yeshua, little, little, you know, little Yeshua in mind, the little kid running around the synagogue. They already had an idea of who he was, and that colored everything they thought about him. You see, this is, this is a worldview issue. So we always interpret evidence in light of what we already believe, according to our worldview. It's the natural things that we do. Uh, it, it's, it's like the man who, who insisted that he was dead. You ever hear this joke? So this man insists that he's dead. He's telling everybody, I, I'm dead. And his wife and kids are just completely exasperated. They're like, Dad, you're not dead. But he continued to insist on the fact. So they tried telling him, look, you're not dead. You're walking and talking and breathing. How can you be dead? But he continues to insist that he was dead. So the family takes him to a doctor. The doctor pulls out some medical books to demonstrate to the man that dead men do not bleed. He tried reasoning with him, showing him all the books. Like, here, here's the scientific evidence that shows that you're not dead, right? And the man refused to believe. Well, after some time, the man, uh, <laughs> the man says, okay, well, hmm. The doctor says, okay, well, I got one more idea. So he takes a pin, and he, he, pokes the, he pokes the finger of the man, and he squeezes out a drop of blood. And he says, you saw in the books that dead men don't bleed, right? He says, yeah. He says, what do you think now? He goes, well, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. Right? This, this is the worldview issue that, we're, that we face as followers of Jesus Christ. The people you talk to who are outside of, of, of the redeemed, outside of the body of Christ, do not, they have a worldview that prevents them from seeing. They already, they, they are dead in their trespasses and sins. And they think that dead men bleed, essentially. So what do we get from this? Well, we learn here that evidence Again, extra-biblical evidence, like the sort that we've been talking about, is not proof. It is merely data, and it must be interpreted. Classic example of this, geology, right? You can take one rock and place it in between two geologists, one a scriptural geologist, one a secular geologist. The the secular geologist is going to look at this rock and say, well, clearly this was formed about 4.6 billion years ago when the earth cooled. It's, a, you know, it's billions and billions of years old. Whereas the scriptural geologist is going to look at this and say what? Oh, well, this rock was formed, you know, this is, this is volcanic rock, so the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, so the rock can be no older than 6,000 years. So wait a minute, they got the exact same rock, so how do they come to such drastically different conclusions about that same physical specimen? 
It's a, it's a worldview. It's a mental and it's a heart issue, isn't it? So if we're trying to do apologetics and we're trying to talk to people and trying to convince them of the truth of the Bible and we're relying upon external evidence, we're failing to hit the actual problem. We're treating symptoms and we're not treating causes. The cause is a worldview issue. It's a heart issue. You go to Romans chapter 1, you realize that everyone knows that God exists and they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. So it's not about evidence. But you know what? It's also not about education. Do you suppose that Peter had advanced degrees in astronomy and geology and philosophy and, and all that? No. So the Bible says explicitly in the opposite direction, right? In Acts chapter 4, it says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, they being the Jewish leadership in the temple, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Do you, have you ever stopped to think about the kind of men that Jesus used to turn the world upside down? Fisherman, a tax collector, a terrorist, right? I mean, these, Simon the Zealot, he was a terrorist. He just used ordinary guys. Uh, Peter had, you know, a cl classic example of foot-in-mouth disease, right? The only time he opened, his, you know, he opened his mouth was to change feet. <laughs> but yet God used him out of the, uh, and, and others to change the world. And he actually allowed him to write two of the books of, uh, two of, the, books of the Bible and probably was uh, a, a serious contributor to the book of Mark. Or a source for the book of Mark, I should say. So, Clearly, based upon Jesus' selection of, the, of, his, of his 12 original disciples, um, you, we don't need to be, you don't need to worry about your training, you don't need to worry about your education and all that. You don't need to get a master's or a PhD in apologetics before you start sharing your faith. You know what your biggest apologetic is? Your life. The whole point of 1 Peter or one of the points of 1 Peter, is that you should be living your life in such a way that when the world looks at you and they see you undergoing persecution and mistreatment for your faith, they should look at you and go, what is wrong with you? At which point you can look at them and say, thanks for asking, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> that is the answer that you were called to give at all times. You better be able to tell people what Christ has done for you and through you, and in you. You should be living, breathing examples of what the Holy Spirit can do to an unregenerate sinner. Because he makes all things new. Your life is the biggest apologetic. You don't need people like me in your churches. You need people like you, being unashamed about what Christ has done for you, and being, being bold enough to speak up. That's what you need. Because you know, Side note, this one's for free. There's, there are no apologists in the Bible. We've got pastors, we've got teachers, you've got people who are gifted with prophecy and all that. Title apologist doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. Every single one of us is called to be an apologist. Okay, back on target, sorry. So, after going through this, so it's not about... It's not about evidence. It's not about extra biblical evidence. It's not about seeing miracles. It's clearly not about education. Because if it were, then all the smart people would be Christians and all the stupid people would be going to hell. And that's not what we see, right? There are lots of stupid Christians and there are lots of really intelligent atheists, self-professing atheists, right? So education is not a factor here. So now you're looking at me going, okay, Dan, you spend a whole lot of time talking about reasons why we don't believe the Bible and some of you are starting to, you're kind of looking at me like this. You're like, um, and I know what you're thinking. I, I do, because I can, I can read faces. You're like, all right, apologist of unusual size, what's the answer? Stop telling me about, what the re about all the negativity. How about some positive reasons? Why do we believe the Bible? Okay, let's get into that. We've gone from the negative phase of our presentation into the positive phase, if you want to go that way. 
So how do we know that the Bible is true? Well, let's see what the Word of God has to say about it. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples who the people say he is. He's like, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they were giving him some answers like, hey, they think you're a great prophet. Maybe you're, some, you know, you're one of the prophets come back from of old. Maybe some, some say you're the prophet, you know, prophesied by Moses. And then Jesus is like, okay, that, uh, that's nice. Then he made it personal. He says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Remember Simon Peter's answer. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. At which point Jesus looked to cast his glance upon Peter and said, Congratulations, Peter. You have gradu graduated from Jesus University. You have mastered all the evidences. You have mastered the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. You are now an apologist. I can now send you out. You are ready. Is that what Jesus said? Was it because of Peter's great study that he was able to come to this conclusion? Everybody go like this. No. There you go. Thank you. Need a little class participation. Well, what did he say? Well, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So wait a minute. The only reason that Peter could confess this way was because the Father had revealed it to him? Well, that's interesting. Huh. Let's look at another story. Remember the account of when the two men were walking to Emmaus on the day that Jesus' uh, empty tomb was discovered? Remember this? Two guys are walking along, and they're kind of like, wow, you know, Debbie Downer, like, it was just, man, you know, they got a seven-mile walk, and they're just kind of going back and forth, talking about, you know, all the things that were going on in Jerusalem with Jesus being crucified and how sad it was, and they had such great hopes for this, this one they thought may have been the Messiah and, and deliver Israel, and then this third man comes walking up, just, hey, guys, how you doing? What's going on? What you talking about? And he's like, they're like, are you a stranger in these parts? Are you not aware of what's been going on? Don't you read the newspapers? You don't, you don't know what's going on the past three days? And Jesus is like, no, what's going on? So they tell him about this guy, Jesus, who was crucified by the Romans. And then, and then he, what's more, you know, this was three days ago. And then some of our women were like, they went cuckoo. And they're telling us that the tomb is empty. And we're, we're trying to figure this out. <laughs> Jesus is just kind of... Oh, guys, 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 how slow you are to believe. And then for the next, I don't know, it takes like, what, two hours, two, maybe three hours to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles on, you know, on hills and rocks wearing open-toed open sandals, right? Man, and he's like, starts talking to them, and they get to Emmaus, and finally he's like, they're like, hey, Jesus, it's the end of the day, come on in and have dinner with us. And he's, Jesus is like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go up on over here. And they're like, no, 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 come on in, have some matzah. So he's like, okay, we'll have some matzah. So they come down to the table, they sit down, and what happens? Jesus prays, breasses, breasses, blesses the bread, and hands it to them. And as soon as he does that, what happened? Their eyes were opened and they recognize him. Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that they walked all the way, the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, blindfolded or with their eyes closed? Is that what we're to understand here? Everybody go like this. No. What are we talking about here? You know that overplayed Christian song? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's what's going on here. God opened their eyes. It was not an act of their own will. It wasn't like they were kind of like, oh, let me think about this for a while, and then finally, oh, now I get it. No, God had to open their eyes before they could see, before they could recognize Jesus. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them all the things concerning himself in all the scriptures, Luke 24, 27. And then it gets even better, because as soon as he hands in the bread, poof, he's gone. And they're like, dude, poof, you got to go tell the guys. So they boogity on back to Jerusalem. Another seven miles, right? I bet they made it in half a time. Because they were, they were stoked because they had just seen Jesus. We got, to we got to tell everybody. So they get to the place where the disciples were hiding out, right? And they're like, dude, we just saw Jesus. They're like, no. And they're like, yeah. No. I'm like, yeah. And while they're arguing about whether or not they had seen Jesus and about how crazy these guys are and probably delirious from the heat, 
what happens? Jesus shows up among them and says, hey guys, got any food? And he ate some food with them, right? And he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is Jesus speaking. To whom is Jesus, or to what is Jesus pointing them? To the scriptures. Look, look, guys, all this stuff was written about me. Remember the scriptures. Go back to the scriptures. Go back to the scriptures. That's the, re that's the refrain we keep seeing over and over again. Go back to the scriptures. Look at the scriptures. And then what happened? They probably still didn't get it, so what did Jesus have to do? Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Suddenly, lights are on, people are at home. <laughs> lights come on. They're like, oh, yeah. Because God flicked the light switch on. God had to open their minds. Wow. Scripture has more to say about this. Jesus, remember in, uh, in John chapter 14, Jesus starts talking about going to, uh, to, a, to a place to prepare, to going to prepare a place for his disciples. And Jesus said, you guys know where I'm going. And Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? How do we know the way to get to where you're going if we don't even know where you're going? You, it's, kind of like, it's kind of important. Got no destination to punch into the GPS, so I have no idea which way to turn. What did Jesus say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But a few chapters earlier, what did Jesus say? Eight chapters earlier, he told his disciples, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So do you see the picture here? Jesus says, nobody can get to the Father except through me. But nobody comes to me except the Father draws him. Like, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Take a read through Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2 especially. Pretty clear. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead men don't get up and walk around. Jesus, the Father has to draw us to the Son, and the Son provides the only route to the Father. And you notice it says here, it says, draws him. The Father draws him. You ever left a child alone in the bathtub? You're a lot smarter than me. Because you know what happens if you leave a child alone in the bathtub. He'll figure out that you can take the water from the tub. And, you know, why be confined to a small tub when you can take the entire bathroom and make it your, your bathtub, right? It's a real estate thing, right? More real estate. So, but does that water just jump out of the tub and onto the floor? Not by itself, it doesn't. What has to happen to that water? It has to be scooped and dumped. It has to be drawn out. And this is the picture we get with salvation. No one comes to, gets, gets to the Father but through me, but no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So how do we know the Bible is true? Maybe you're starting to see what's going on here, you're starting to pick up a, a theme in John chapter 10, Jesus is having a really tense throwdown with the Jewish leadership. And they just say, look, if you're the Christ, just tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them and told you, he says, look, I told you, but you still don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But why didn't they believe? You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. You don't believe because you're, you're not one of his sheep. So how do we know the Bible is true? Well, we see another hint in Ephesians 1. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. So how is it that we know that the Bible is true? Because God opens our eyes. He reveals it to us as true. 
You know, one of my, my biggest regrets from my first, the first version of this presentation was that I would stand before an audience and I would speak for a good solid hour, 50 minutes to an hour, and I never once, never once quoted scripture. It's like, I just imagine Jesus standing in the back of the room, kind of going, okay, Dan, you've had 50 minutes. Um, when do I get a chance to say something? And I was like, wow. Yeah, that was, it was a huge oversight. No wonder why the Holy Spirit was hammering me. It's like, you wouldn't even let me get a word in edgewise, Dan. Smack, smack. Take that. So to correct, as part of my penance, no, I'm not Catholic, it's just a joke. Um, I, I wanna, I wanna un, I'm trying to undo that. And what I, what I endeavor to do in my presentations now is I want to give God, I want to make, I, wanna, I, I strive to give him more time than I do. I just want to be up here connecting verses together to help you understand what's going on, to help you see the big picture. But God should be doing most of the talking. And to that end, I want to end by reading you 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Yes, the entire chapter. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. I believe he spent a year and a half with them. While I was among you, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What was the most important thing? Gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. The gospel. He passed on to them, on to them what was of first importance, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But alas, we're here in chapter 2. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Do you see why you shouldn't worry about your lack of education or lack, your lack of training when it comes to being an apologist or doing apologetics? It's irrelevant. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Holy Spirit using you for his glory. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him, for to us God revealed them through the Holy Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And again, as Ephesians 2 tells us, and he is spiritually dead. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So in review, why should anyone believe the Bible? This is where you talk to me. Because it's true. Thank you very much, sir. Because, indeed, it is true. How do we know that the Bible is true? Not just because it's changed your lives, but why has it done that? How did you come to the point where it could change your life? Because God reveals it to us. So when my brother in the Lord, the one who comes from a different theological camp than me, the one who told me that he hated my presentation, at which I rejoiced, right? 
When he asked me, why do, you believe the, why do you believe the Bible is true? I said, because God has given me eyes to see and ears to hear, and he's given me a heart of flesh to receive it. Without him, I could do none of, none of those things. Which makes the, the question, then why do you teach your audiences something different, all the more painful to answer. So God reveals it to us, folks. The Bible is very, very clear about this. So when should we use evidence? And by which I mean extra biblical evidence. I didn't really cover this. So this is going to be like a little, a little addendum here. We should use external evidence. So using external evidences and talking about manuscripts and things like that is not bad. It's not unbiblical. But the proper way to use them is to refute, refute and to bolster. Now, what do I mean by this? To refute. For example, when somebody comes up to you and says, well, you can't believe the Bible because it's been translated and retranslated so many times that what we have today isn't, and it couldn't possibly be what we, that the original authors had written. See, when that happens, then you can pull out your manuscript card from your back pocket, your manuscript evidence card, and you can say, well, it seems to me that what you're, you're assuming is that the transmission of the Bible is like a giant 2,000-year game of telephone. You know, and he tells, a, he tells one, some, somebody, and he tells somebody, and it kind of goes, you know, serial transmission. But it's more like the old shampoo commercial. You know, she uses the shampoo, and then she tells two friends, and then she tells two friends. And does anybody remember this commercial, or is it just me who spent way too much time watching TV in the late 70s and early 80s? And so on, and so on, and so on, right? It's parallel transmission. You can talk about the documents and the document fragments and how we, have, we, can, we can reproduce pretty much the entire Bible with the exception of a couple different verses based upon just the things that the early church fathers have written. So do we, have, do we have certainty that what we have today is what was written originally? Yeah. And we can talk about why. But don't expect that to convince anybody to believe the Bible. Say, oh, well, I guess I should believe it then. No, because all that proves is that we have accurate transmission. It doesn't say anything about the message itself. See where I'm going with that? So you can use that to refute mistaken ideas about our faith, about the Bible, about God, about whatever. What's this business about bolstering? Well, remember when John the Baptist was locked up in prison, getting ready to get separated from his knowledge box. Remember he sent one of his disciples to Jesus, and what did he say to him? Um, are, are you the one that we were waiting for, or was there somebody else we should be expecting? And in parentheses, because I didn't think I was supposed to be getting ready to get killed. I thought this was supposed to be glory time, not, you know, martyr time. And what did Jesus say to him? Go back and tell John what you've seen. The dead are raised to life, lepers are healed, the blind receive sight. And you may be inclined to say, well, look, Dan, Jesus appealed to evidence, right? There's the evidence, there are the miracles. Ah, on the surface it looks like he's appealing to evidence, but really what he's doing is he's pointing John back to Scripture. Because the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would do such things, and nobody had ever done such things before. Has anybody ever heard of a man being born blind and been given sight? Everybody was shocked when that happened. It doesn't happen, folks. So what Jesus was doing, he's like, you know what's, what's been going on out here, and you know that only Messiah can do that. I've done these things. You put two and two together. Right? So Jesus, even Jesus was appealing to Scripture in his reference to the miracles that he performed. And lastly, last review question, what does the unbeliever need most? Does the unbeliever most need to hear about your fantastic arguments for the existence of God? Does the unbeliever need to hear about all the fantastic supporting evidence for the flood or for creation? Is, is, is that what's going to bring him to his knees before a holy God and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of, message of Christ, the gospel. What the unbeliever needs most to hear is the gospel. If your apologetic endeavors are, do not have as their aim getting to the gospel and presenting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through him. And then because of our sinful state, we all are, ju- are justly condemned to hell in e- for eternity without him. 
If your message does not include that, me- if you're, you're talking with unbelievers and you're you know, doing apologetics and you're not getting there, I submit to you that you may be wasting your time. Don't focus on the minors, folks. Paul resolved to know nothing while he was among the Corinthians, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing. That was the most important thing. Million and one other things you could talk about, million and one other things you can argue about. But when push comes to shove, the unbeliever better be hearing the gospel from you. Because that's the only message that can save him. So for us believers, I have a challenge for you to not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I spent too many years, my early years, in doing, you know, doing apologetics and trying to argue with atheists, too many years not giving them the gospel. And all I'm doing is just dancing around the edges of this, the, the important issue. The one message that has the power to save them through the, through the Holy Spirit, and I wasn't giving it to them. Don't do like I did. And if you're not a believer today, then I have a challenge for you. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Thank you. Amen, pooch. That's, the, that's even right. better than applause. I can it's make the right. dogs bark. We've got a few minutes for some questions. If, uh, sometimes the question and answer sessions on, the, on these are some of the best parts. I've, uh, I've seen it challenge speakers and take them in a new direction. So please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Let me bring your mic back to you so we can have it. It's just a quick uh, addition to the gospel that I always thought that the gospel was the creator became the savior. Mm-hmm. And if you lift the first part, the creator, you're only giving two-thirds of the gospel. Would you, would you, you, you know, because even when Paul said, when you go to these people, you always use the word that, you know, I'm preaching you the gospel from the creator who made everything, and then he goes on. So do we miss that by, by saying, not including Jesus as creator in the gospel, and just say, well, he did this, and he came, and I'm just curious. All right. Well, Paul didn't seem to think so. So I resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, does that preclude us from talking about God as creator? No, of, of course it doesn't. But the core of the gospel, the essential message, is Jesus Christ and him crucified. For Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, right, I alluded to this earlier, that I, I passed on to you what was of first, for, foremost importance, that Jesus Christ was crucified according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by many witnesses thereafter attesting to his resurrection. And he goes on about to say that the resurrection, like unless, unless Christ is raised, you are still in your sins, and your faith is futile. So it's all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, if, you want to, if, if, you're, if, the, if the unbeliever wants to press you and say, well, what gives him the right to make the rules and decide who goes to heaven or hell? That's when you say, well, you know, if I'm in my garage and I'm making something out of wood, and I decide that I don't like what, I make, what I'm making, it's a total abomination, it needs to go into the fireplace, then who's going to stop me from doing that? I bought the wood, I put the time and effort into it, I get to throw it in the fire. But if one of my children walks into the garage and makes that executive decision for me, it will, there will not be peace in the house, right? Because that child of mine is not sovereign, if you will, over the work of my hands. God is sovereign over his creation. And because he is our creator, because he created everything that is, then he has absolute right to say how things are going to go. And he has the right to say, there is one way to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ. There are not multiple paths to heaven. There is one way, one truth, and one life. And that way, truth, and life is Jesus Christ. Any other questions? Can we give an example? Hang on, let me bring the mic back to you, brother. We got people watching online and stuff. Sorry. You're going to be famous, Rigo. <laughs> hey, Dan, can, um, can you give an example of how to share the gospel? Like, 
Yeah, well, it, it varies from, 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 from situation to situation, right? If you're, if you're limited to 128 characters on Twitter, right, uh, then you basically got to cut right to the quick. Somebody says, give me proof for God. Says, you know what, I don't need to give you proof for God. God says you already know he exists, and you just suppress that truth and unrighteousness. You're a sinner on your way to hell. Here's a link to a Ray Comfort video. Here, go watch that, right? Uh, if you want really good examples of how to share the gospel and how to use the law to drive somebody to the gospel, because the law was given to us as a tutor, uh, the Greek word is paedagogos, as, as a tutor or an instructor to lead us to Christ. So through the law, we realize who we are in the sight of a holy God. We, 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 cannot, we cannot meet the, the requirements of the law. We are all doomed. And so what the law is intended to do is to show us that, look, you need something beyond yourself because you can't, you can't do this. If you can't observe the law perfectly, you're doomed. And so then what you do is you use the law and you, you do something like this. You say, can, you know, you go, just, go, just walk through the Ten Commandments. Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word? Well, yeah, of course. Did you ever, you know, this is, this is, I'm, I'm parroting Ray Comfort now. W would you use your mom's name as a cuss word? No. Well, no, of course not. Well, why not? Well, because I love her. So, so why would you use God's name as a cuss word? He did more than, he did more than just bring you into this, life, into this world, like your mom did, right? Have you, ever, have you ever stolen anything? Yes, I have. Have you ever looked at a woman or have you ever looked at a man with lust in your heart? Well, Jesus says if you've done that, you've committed adultery. Have you ever done that? Yes, I have. So you go through the law and you get, them, you get the person to condemn himself by agreeing with the law that his acts are evil. And then you say to him, so how do you think it's going to go for you on judgment day when you stand before God? And he says, why should I let you into my heaven? You're a lying, blaspheming adulterer at heart. Why should I let you into my heaven? Oh, because I did some good stuff. Really? Is that the way our human courts work? You know, Your Honor, I, I realize that I killed 10 people in a drunk, you know, I got drunk and I, and I, I mowed over 10 people, but I, I've contributed to, to charities and I, and I do volunteer work at my church. Is, is that going to save you? Your works aren't going to save you in front of a human judge. Why would the judge of all of mankind give you any slack for doing a couple good things when you've sinned against him? So yeah, go to Living Waters, the, the YouTube, YouTube page for, for, uh, for Ray Comfort and his ministry. Great examples of how to do man on the street sharing the gospel. And it's, it's really, really powerful. Let the word of God speak. And when somebody says, you know what? That's, that's true for you, not true for me. You know, the Bible, I, I don't believe the Bible. You know, I don't even believe in your God. It doesn't matter. Your opinion of God doesn't change the ultimate reality that you're going to stand before him one day in judgment. Just state the facts, folks. You don't need to come up with clever arguments to try to persuade them. It's not our job to convince, convert, or con convert anybody. Convince, convince, convert, or convict anybody. Not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Don't take his job. He doesn't like it when you take his job. He does a far better job at his job than you do. Our job is basically just to be a nice, clean soda straw. You ever see somebody go to uh, like Cold Stone Creamery and get, get a milkshake and then sit over there in the corner and go, oh man, this straw is amazing. Wow, what a fantastic straw. Does anybody ever comment about the straw? No, what are they talking about? They're talking about the milkshake because the milkshake is good. The straw is just a way to get the milkshake from the cup into your mouth. And the only time you, you really notice the straw is when it what? It when it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, cardboard. Don't even get me started. <laughs> right? So what happens when you start going down on a, on a milkshake and you're like, <laughs> what happened? I've got a split in my straw, letting in all kinds of air. It kills the enjoyment, doesn't it? right? We're called to be soda straws, clean and unbroken, standing right before God. You let your soda straw, you know, you use the soda straw a couple times, get a couple milkshakes down it, don't wash it out, it's going to get crusty and nasty, it's going to start growing stuff in there. And then the, anything that comes through that straw, it's going to be tainted. Keep short accounts with God. Don't sit there and pile up sins and think that, oh yeah, everything will be okay. 
God can still use me. Well, yeah, he might have to use you in spite of you. So be a clean, clean soda straw. Let people focus on the message that you're delivering to them and not on, on you, right? Gospel's already an offense. We don't need to add to the offense by being a cracked or nasty soda straw, right? Does that answer your question? You have, do I pass? <laughs> <laughs> any, others, any other questions? Last call. All right, Big Dan, I want to let you know this, this message spoke to me. It for sure did. Hope it did to you, too. I, let me, uh, t- a couple of weeks ago, the reason why I wasn't here, I didn't loop you guys in, is that uh, I went on a mission trip with, uh, with a bunch of high school students to L.A. to uh, serve at the Dream Center, which is a massive uh, center that's involved in homeless outreach, uh, drug addiction uh, relief, and, and a poverty assistance, that, this kind of thing. And uh, one of the things that we did was... Uh, that we went around Skid Row. We did some ministry at Skid Row, walking around, uh, giving out snacks and uh, with a bunch of high school students. And uh, before this trip, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it was, it was something I would have done. The first time we went, uh, so we did it a couple of, different, couple of times with, those, the dream, with some Dream Center leaders. The first time we went out there, I was, uh, I was quiet. I was, uh, you know, pulling the wagon. We were, had a bunch of snacks with us, and I was there for the students, right, to support them and let them do their, their mission work. And so I was, I was quiet. I didn't I really talk to, to people. The second time we went out, I finally stepped out, and uh, I was one out. I was, we, so we were passing out snacks, and every single person I gave a snack to, I, uh, I talked to, and I, I asked if I could pray for them. And uh, there were a couple that I tried to... You know, get engaged in the apo- kind of apologetics t- mm-hmm. type talk to them. Uh, my, one of my big things is as p- people that are lost because they've been, in a, because they've been uh, deceived by naturalism. To, and uh, they're lost because they do not understand who they are. And mm-hmm. they do not understand where they are. They do not understand that they're a child of the, child of the living God. They think they're an evolved animal. So I, I think that this is my job is to wake them up to the truth of the reality of who they are. But... Uh, one of, the things that I, one of the things that I learned by, when I was uh, praying for people, almost everyone said yes. So I asked to pray, prayed for 30 or 40 people, maybe on Skid Row. Every single person I gave a snack to, I asked if I could pray for them, and almost everyone said yes. A couple did not, but almost everyone said yes, which told me that, I mean, who would say yes to that who, who was an atheist? I mean, if you were a true atheist, you would laugh that off. No, I don't need to pray for me. Who are you going to pray for? The fact that they said yes told me that they do believe. They have a conscience of that God is real. They know this inside. They've suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and allowed them to live the way they do without uh, the con- with the conviction that would come with that, but they know. Amen. And uh, rather than the apologi- it wasn't the apologetics that they needed, but they needed to be reminded of what they know already. They, they, they know that God is real and that he has created them, that he's created this wonderful world. Amen. And then remind them of what he has done for them through the death of Jesus and, and how, how they're living and how that, but uh, yeah. And one thing that I like to point out, I have another presentation called Apologetics is Not What You Think, which I delivered last year about this time here. Uh, it's, on your, it's on your website. Uh, go, go look at that. Uh, re- that's another presentation I did What kind of goes more into the depth of what apologetics is and not to give too much away. But basically, when, it, when you boil it all down, there really should, the difference between apologetics and evangelism should be completely indistinguishable. The whole point of apologetics is evangelism. It's getting the gospel to people and just knocking down their objections, answering their questions, answering legitimate questions, but knocking down objections and saying, let's get to the gospel because that's the power of God unto salvation. Awesome. Would you close down the word of prayer? Yes. Father, thank you so much for this time that you have ordained for us to be together today to hear your word. And Father, thank you so much for not smiting me, for getting it wrong so many times before, for having the patience with me to send a brother in the Lord along who could challenge me and ask the hard questions and cause me to see what it is that I've been missing. Father, I pray that there be some here within the sound of my voice today, whether it be here in person or online or somebody listening months down the road, 
I pray, Father, that this, would, uh, this message would touch them. Not, nothing that I've said, Lord, but that the way that your scripture speaks. Father, thank you for opening our eyes, for softening our hearts, for opening our ears, that we might receive your word with gladness. And I pray, Father, that as we go out from here today, that we would not be just hearers of the word, but we would be doers. Lord, help us to put this into practice. And we ask this in the, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen.